What does it take to end a war? What does it take to ensure a peace? What does it mean to be people of faith in a global society? We are in a world in which religion and politics are inevitably entangled. Can people of different faiths cooperate in the human story to work for peace? Guatemala is an ideal laboratory or case study. Thousands of stories are being told across Guatemala today. But what you learn very quickly in this country is that every story carries another much bigger story, one that overarches everything else. La violencia. La violencia. La violencia. For 40 years, the way that people have resolved problems in Guatemala has been through open armed conflict. But there has been a culture of violence here for at least 500 years. Violence is a sorcerer. It wears many faces. The most obvious face is war. Guatemala's civil war, itself called La Violencia, the violence lives on vividly in the memory of its survivors. Esta es mi familia y ella es mi hermana que la secuestraron y ella es mi hermana mayor, es Justina y ella es ella es yo. <laughs> Natalia y Marta, mi hermana menor, ella es mi mamá la que la mataron. The Atz sisters, Natalia, Marta, and Justina, along with their father, Alejandro Atz, have agreed to tell their story to the world. The family is Cachiquel Maya, part of the huge indigenous population of Guatemala. Today, they live in the city of Chimaltenango, where the women help to run a weaving cooperative. Twenty years ago, they lived in an aldea, a widespread rural village like thousands of others in Guatemala's mountainous countryside. Right now, life in the village seems idyllic. Neighborhood women are preparing a lunch for us all, and there's nothing to suggest what happened here 20 years ago when they were children. El año 1979, estudiar en la escuela. Cuando yo estaba en, en primer año en la escuela, fue cuando empezó ya la, la, la violencia en sí eh, en nuestras comunidades. En primer lugar, yo Tal vez la primera vez que nos dimos cuenta que había, que había peligro, un día que entraron en la aldea y empezaron a, se empezaron a escuchar como cohetes. Y empecé, eh, se escuchó cohetes por aquí, cohetes por allá. Pero ¿qué, qué es si no hay fiesta? Y como a la hora supimos que habían matado a, a varias personas ese mismo día y que dentro de esas, de esas uh, personas que habían muerto estaban mi tío y mi primo. Siendo un, una niña pues que, que no, 
No sé, jamás, jamás me hubiera imaginado que, que hay gente que matan a otras gentes. ¿Y por qué? Que llegaba al ejército dos, tres veces por semana. Hay veces llegaba la mañana, se regresaba antes de mediodía. A la tarde volvía a llegar otra vez, pues, entonces no, no se podía trabajar. Al momento de llegar, pues, todos a, a correr, pues, en, en el monte. Pues salía uno, no sabía si regresaba mañana, si regresaba en una hora o si regresaba a los 15 días. Que salieron de allá, pasaron por ahí para llegar allá. There are four entrances into the village, Justina explains, and they never knew which way the army would come in. Todo el mundo estaba atemorizado y no se podía... Guatemalans are, are wrestling with their past and trying to figure out what they think about it and still trying to tell the story. But as they tell that story, it's important that the story gets told about everyone who was involved in the conflict. And one of the players in that conflict was the United States. It was the United States, the Central Intelligence Agency, that basically got the ball rolling on this horrible uh, epic of violence in 1954 when they overthrew the president of Guatemala. In 1954, the United States intervened in Guatemala to bring an end to the Guatemalan Revolution. And it's the heart of the Cold War. And there was a great fear in 1954 that communists were or had already taken over Guatemala and the government had to go. Well, that and the fact that the, the democratically elected regime of Jacobo Arbenz threatened to expropriate land that belonged to the United Fruit Company. What happens afterwards is a military government comes to power in Guatemala. The Guatemalan government increasingly becomes a militarized uh, national security state. The cutting off of U.S. military aid to Guatemala comes in 1977. In some ways, it backfires. Uh, Guatemala turned from uh, the United States to Israel, and the human rights violations continue. And in fact, as has been more recently revealed, is that at the precise time that the Carter administration was publicly saying, you know, decrying human rights violations in Guatemala and threatening to revoke uh, U.S. military aid, uh, the CIA is funneling a million dollars, millions of dollars into Guatemala. In fact, at that point, atrocities accelerated shockingly throughout the country. Not just killing, but torture, rape, dismemberment. Whole villages burned down, no one spared. <laughs> the guerrilla movement was trying to have a merging of its different fronts. There was a strategic need for the army to break the back of any support for the armed opposition, especially throughout the central and western highlands. It was a prevailing fear among the military that the Maya would join the guerrillas and try to take over the country. The recognition that Guatemala is a multi-ethnic, multilingual, and a pluricultural state with over 22 language groups takes on a huge importance. Over half of the population is Maya. Many Ladinos, those of mixed background, who largely occupy urban areas, were also deeply affected by the war. But the rural Maya, such as the Otz family, were the subjects of actual genocide. Cuando tenía 19 años, Señor Otz, who was a Roman Catholic lay leader in the aldea, a catechist, thinks that they may have been under siege because the village cooperative was mistaken by the military as a communist enterprise. Catechists grew out of the scarcity of priests and out of the need to have an enculturated Guatemalan religion of people who spoke the 22 languages and could reinterpret Christianity for people at that level. But even within the Catholic Church you find different um, facets or different factions. Uh, you've got a fairly conservative um, faction which actually in the beginning years of the war uh, Guatemala had a cardinal uh, who was um, a rabid anti-communist and provided uh, spiritual support or ideological justification for the U.S. intervention in the 50s for the beginnings of the counterinsurgency movement for the repression against the indigenous uh, majority. 
That's about to change, though, because of the Second Vatican Council that means from 1962 to 1965. The Catholic Church begins to define uh, something like poverty or racism as being a structural sin, actually in terms of sin and grace, and encouraging everyday Catholics not to accept their lot in life, but to do something about it. The progressive sector of the Catholic Church was identified by the military as being part of the, the guerrilla movement. Many priests were killed or expelled from the country, but catechists died by the hundreds. Que al principio cuando venían mataban a solo hombres y al rato nos dijeron que habían matado a la esposa de mi tío y Y, y al, al rato escuchamos que habían matado a la esposa del otro mi tío. Y en la casa, en la vecindad, fueron a lavar el cuchillo con los que lo habían degollado a, a, a mis tías políticas. Y fue, fue demasiado fuerte para nosotros, pues, pero... When a party horn sounded, that was a signal. The army had arrived, and everyone must run and hide however they could. Y los niños que se quedaban atrás, las demás personas, cualquier persona se lo llevaba para para salvarlo y era para salvar todo. Todo era un descontrol. Después vinieron los helicópteros a rastrear el área, ¿ves? a rastrear todo y tiraron bombas, bombas o no sé qué, tiran con el helicóptero así a dar. People like the Otz family uh, who experienced massacres in their town are very sure who the perpetrators were. Guerrillas seldom wantonly murdered civilians. Their style of destruction was more strategic. This isn't to say that the guerrillas never came into a town and uh, you know, killed, killed informers or massacred a family or whatever. Um, but I think m most people you talk to will say that the, the army did the majority, the vast majority of the killings. And I think their, their reasons for it is because their experience with the guerrillas were mainly and when they showed up dressed in their uniforms and things, it was to, to try to educate people, if you will, and, and to convert them to, to, to support the revolution. They spent a lot of time occupying towns to, to explain to the villagers what the revolution was all about and why they were fighting their war and they were defending the poor and, and fighting against the rich. They wanted to take away the land of the rich and redistribute it to the poor. And then they left and then suddenly the army showed up and started kidnapping people or massacring villages, and the guerrillas proved militarily incapable of defending the communities they were trying to persuade to join them. Uh, I think that turned people uh, increasingly uh, against the guerrillas. Religion during this whole period was an element of the division in the community. It was frequent for Protestant leaders who in good faith felt that they must support the government to denounce both Catholic and Mayan leaders as being uh, subversives because of their social commitment. Now there are obviously exceptions and there were a number of people in, in a number of different churches that became involved with the guerrilla movement. Some by choice, some uh, were forced into it. Like most Guatemalans, uh, evangelical Christians have been victims more than anything else. Uh, they haven't really wanted to be involved on either side, and, and they've been caught in the middle. One little village of, uh, of Cotzal um, had uh, two Methodist pastors uh, who were killed by the military, uh, one who was also a school teacher. And uh, he was killed because in his, uh, in his classes with students, uh, he was having them read the Constitution uh, and the Bible. He figured those were the sort of safe documents that he could, uh, he could study with his students. But 
You know, there were things in the Bible and in the Constitution that were just too damn subversive. And uh, he got taken away from his house one night, and, and the next morning his body was found in, in a ravine. Um, so, you know, there, were, there was no community, no faith group that was untouched by, uh, by the violence. It was during the last army offensive on the village that Senor Atz lost his wife and one of his daughters. The army had arrived in three truckloads that time and had stayed two days and nights. When they left, someone rang the church bell, as was the custom when the soldiers departed. As soon as the army was gone, Senor Atz and his family decided to head for the safety of Chimaltenango, ten miles away. They were on foot. They ran to escape one group of soldiers and were confronted by another which fired on them. The family dispersed in all directions. The bell had been rung too soon, and the soldiers had heard it and returned, this time blocking all four exits from the village. Pero ya, ya no la pudimos enterrar porque al ratito entraron otros cuatro camiones de, de soldados que la tuvimos que dejar allí y tuvimos que huir de nuevo para, para salvar nuestras vidas. In all, eight members of the extended Otz family were killed or abducted in that series of raids, including a three-year-old boy. The remaining orphaned children, 15 in all, went to live with their grandmother, high up in the aldea. Thank you, she says. Thank you for coming. By the time you get into the 1980s, um, you have a country where almost 200,000 people, uh, in a country of 10 million people, say at that time, almost 200,000 people have been killed or disappeared, where probably around 400 villages, entire villages have been raised, have been wiped off of the map. When Rios Mont assumed power after the coup in 1982, Things changed for better and for worse. What happens under the Rios Montt regime is a very clear cut, here is the line in the sand. If you cross that line, we're going to kill you and we're going to do the most terrible and brutal things to you that you can imagine. Rios Montt was a born again Pentecostal, which certainly influenced his discourse, if not his actions. He used a lot of evangelical language. He would go on TV every Sunday night and 
give what people call the sermons. He seemed to know how to do it, how to accomplish this. And he would say, well, the fundamental problem here in this country is we are corrupt and we need to end corruption. All of us are corrupt, including my fellow Army generals. And so he adopted a policy. You would see posters all over the country, a blue and white poster of this hand, which was no robo, no miento, no abuso. So the anti-corruption campaign was something everybody could agree with. If you follow these rules and you do these things, then um, you know, you'll be safe from this kind of, of violence. He talked about what he called national unity. And it's very clear when he talks about national unity that what it means to be Guatemalan is it means to be Ladino. It doesn't mean to be indigenous. It means you should be Spanish speaking, you should be participating in the commercial economy, um, you should recognize the government's authority over you. The price for these objectives was at the expense of the indigenous people. If the indigenous people won't be assimilated, then there's another choice there, right, which is to eliminate them. It helps to explain why there is just this massive overkill during the, the Rio Smont period, because even under the worst of circumstances, it's not in a government's interest, anybody's government, usually to kill off large numbers of its own people. It ha you have to be able to explain that in some way. In gran medida, lo que podemos llamar, unos llaman excesos, que es un eufemismo para decir una barbarie cometida en contra de la población y que no puede ser justificada de ninguna manera. Y todas estas acciones no fueron parte de una política de Estado, sino fueron más una ineficiencia de control sobre el ambiente táctico que sobre, se sobreextendió en determinados momentos. Yo creo que eso que usted está afirmando de que el ejército de manera institucional no tiene responsabilidad en la violación de los derechos humanos y de las masacres eh, no concuerda con, la, con los hechos y y con la historia y con lo mismo que está sucediendo hoy. I think one of the undercurrents of Guatemalan history is the great fear that the indigenous people would rise up. You can go all the way back to 1524 and see the Spanish conquistador Pedro de Alvarado, who's very much afraid of that. I think you can also see that in whether it's 1524, or 1824, or 1924, and probably in 2024. Fear of change, fear of the unknown Mayan other. War had become a way of life, war had become a business. Um, there, was, there, was, there was no logic in the conflict that was going to lead it to any, conf any conclusion. I was in the 83 and I started to realize that the war was not the way. But when I say I started to realize that the war was not the way, it means that I had hope that the war was the way of liberation. Julia Esquivel, an internationally known Guatemalan poet, was sympathetic to many of the guerrilla causes. No se da cuenta que toda guerra es horrenda, que no puede ser solución, que no es solución. The guerrillas were not going to win militarily. Um, a lot of people believe that the military really had no desire to completely defeat the guerrillas because as long as the guerrillas existed, uh, it provided a reason for the military to continue its repression against the people. Um, so the country was in this, this sort of uh, lockstep uh, dance of death. The guerrillas had a reason to exist, the military had a reason to exist. Both sides um, were living in some ways off of, off of the war. Um, and what the churches were able to do in Guatemala was to enter into that, um, that, that dance of death between these two sides and, and discover something different. The church creates a space where human rights could be talked about, where people could come with their complaints, be it complaints about the military or complaints about the guerrillas. Uh, and that was a difficult space to carve out in the middle of this conflict. But I think one of the clearest voices in that time with 
perhaps the, the least hidden agenda was the voice of the Catholic bishops, uh, who spoke out in very clear terms in their pastoral letters um, about the need for an authentic peace. Fuimos desarrollando esta idea de que la paz no era simplemente una firma para que el conflicto cesara, sino que debería de ser toda una serie de cambios que incluían estrategias, mecanismos para poder lograr una sociedad guatemalteca en donde este problema estructural de injusticia y de exclusión fuera eliminado. The Mennonites held a similar concept of authentic peace though without the wide influence of the Catholic bishops. This is a, one expression of the Mennonite church in Guatemala. Uh, we was working most hard with the peace process in Guatemala. Mario Higueros, a member of this congregation, serves as dean of Semilla, the Mennonite seminary in Guatemala City. We asked him to comment on Bishop Ramazzini's concept of authentic peace. Sí, estoy de acuerdo con eso porque este nosotros como menonitas pensamos que la paz es algo integral. Nosotros desde el punto de vista uh, diríamos uh, teológico usamos la palabra shalom. La palabra shalom quiere decir satisfacción en todas las áreas de la vida. Y es cierto. In Guatemala, one of the great problems is the problem of injustice social, the problem of the injustice economic. Until this doesn't change substantively, we can't talk about peace. But this commitment to active peacemaking was not typical of most Protestant churches during the war. In general, evangelical Christians in Guatemala tend to be very uh, apolitical, they don't get involved in, in matters of that sort. If they can help it, obviously, in the war, they, many of them couldn't help it. Uh, on the other hand, there is a, a, a strong teaching in the churches, uh, based on Romans 12, that the government is instituted by God and the, the government should be respected. So on the whole, churches would be supporting of the government, but not directly involved. I don't think there's any question that the Catholic Church has been much more active in being front and center in the peace process in large part because the Catholic Church has sort of a, a political mechanism that allows it to do it, it allows it to take this sort of role. Another factor is that the Catholic Church is everywhere in Guatemala. You know, Guatemala is always touted as being 30 percent Protestant, but you know, even if it's 30 percent Protestant, it's still 70 percent Catholic. But the other thing is there isn't a Protestant church. Reliable numbers are hard to come by, but there's probably somewhere in the vicinity of 300 different denominations in Guatemala. Many of these consist of small, independent churches, leading to what could be called the amoeba school of church growth. You do see certain individuals out of the Protestant community, prominent Protestants, who are engaged and very actively involved in the peace process. Even with increasing internal peace efforts, the Guatemalan peace process might not have succeeded if it were not for the support of international organizations. También tengo la referencia de la Federación Luterana Mundial, que fue determinante y que se ha dicho muy poco de esto, porque fue la Federación Luterana Mundial la que pagó, la que instó, la que motivó, la que estimuló para que el diálogo entre guerrilla y gobierno y ejército por fin cuajara en una negociación por la paz. Two Lutheran clergymen, Philip Anderson and Paul Wee, who were active in that peace initiative, met with us to record their story at the Church of the Reformation in Washington, D.C., where Paul Wee was once the pastor. Reverend Wee described the impact of his first visit to Guatemala in 1981. Some of the stories that the people came to share with us, we could only hear for a short time. Then we had to say, stop. Give me a moment to catch my breath. I can't take all of this. Working in Geneva as Assistant General Secretary of the Lutheran World Federation, Paul Wee got to know some of the guerrilla leaders and was impressed by what he felt was their genuine commitment to a just peace and democratic reforms. I took advantage of that 
met with the guerrilla leaders over a long period of time, and out of that uh, developed a plan to see if we couldn't make a contribution as churches around the world to a just peace in Guatemala. With the approval of the Catholic bishops and the National Reconciliation Commission, we and Anderson met with General Hector Gramajo, the Minister of Defense, and secured his agreement to send representatives to a meeting with guerrilla leaders at a neutral location to talk about peace. The place was Oslo, Norway, and the time, March 1990. Waiting at the airport, Paul Wee wondered if anyone would show up. But they did. A guerrilla delegation and a delegation representing the National Reconciliation Commission, both groups with full authority from government, military, and guerrilla leaders to conclude an agreement. We were taken to a chalet up in the Holman Cullen Mountains behind uh, the city of Oslo. So we began with the usual uh, congenial words of welcome, and then uh, there was business hard business. Everybody had a lot to get out in the first days of those meetings uh, was a lot of recrimination. It didn't go well, to be honest. The only change came on the last day, not around the conference table, but at a restaurant across the street during their last meal together. The mood was somber at first because no agreement had been reached on a procedure for the future. But then Jorge Rosal, one of the guerrilla leaders, stood up and talked to the group as friends, some of whom had known each other since childhood, but had gone in different directions. He said, to be sure, we all had what we considered the well-being of our country at heart. But some of us said we cannot proceed in this way with two societies. We have to build this society as a single people. But he said, I have also made some mistakes along the way. Out of good intentions, and I think good motives, I have sometimes done the wrong thing. And look, he said, look what's happened. 200,000 people lie dead. And partly I am responsible for that. Well, this is a powerful moment, and I remember just being struck by the candor and the confession from one person, but then someone else stood up from the other side and, thank you for that, he said, thank you for saying what you said, and I want to say something to you as a brother and as a Guatemalan. And he also talked about his shortcomings. And somehow this started moving around the table. When it was all over, or almost over, people were standing up and giving each other this abrazo and weeping on each other's shoulders. People who had been such harsh enemies during preceding years. It was a significant turning point. They decided they couldn't go home without something in hand. So they went back across the street to the chalet and at 4.30 in the morning completed a page and a half document that became the basis for the process that led to the final peace accords in December 1996. Senor Lopez Bonilla was not at that first meeting in Oslo, but he went on to describe a similar mood at later negotiations he did attend. Entonces, esa catarsis poco a poco ayudó a, a decantar la situación, a distender el ambiente y entonces nos dimos cuenta que el oponente al que nunca habíamos visto y lo veíamos ya de frente, pues era una persona de carne y hueso como nosotros, que también era capaz de reír, de hacer bromas, de enojarse, de sentir. For the next six years, more meetings were held in Spain, Costa Rica, Canada, Ecuador, Washington and Mexico hammering out agreements on separate elements of a general peace accord. The United Nations used its influence to move the process along. Finally, on December 29, 1996, the war officially came to an end with the formal signing of the peace accords in the National Palace. In addition to dignitaries from around the world, thousands of Guatemalans made their way to the capital from every part of the country.
Certainly being invited to attend the signing of the, the peace accords uh, was like a fulfillment of, of many, many years uh, of work, but also uh, a thrill for the Guatemalan people that this was their labor. It was a, a celebration, not just the several hours that we were at the National Palace, but three days, sort of some preparations, the international community making itself present. It was one of the great uh, moments in, in my life. Two days later, reality came back to me. I stayed a few days after the signing of the peace accord, drove off to the beautiful area of Lake At Atitlan, a Panahachel area, to see some friends. On the way in the highlands, just before you go down to the lake, came across what was obviously a mob scene. They burned those two men alive with gasoline right in front of my eyes. <laughs> They had come into the community evidently earlier in the day and tried to rob someone. In fact, in the process of robbing some somebody, they shot someone. So here I was, having been a part of the peace process, and there was no way that I could stop this revenge from happening. It taught me a lot, the whole issue of impunity, for violence and the distrust that over years, centuries, people have no trust in their own authorities. In the midst of this incredible beauty, you still have this sense of distrust and fear. Which has been, even with the end of the war, has been hard for people to, to overcome. We're not capable to go out in the, in the morning and act normally like nothing happened because of the past that we, we've been through. Fear and distrust are the legacy of violence. They lead to silence, and silence abets more violence. The only way to break that pattern of violence, the Catholic Church insisted even before the end of the war, was to break the pattern of silence first, to work from a basis of truth. So the Recovery of Historical Memory Project was launched. The bishop said, in order for us to move on to authentic reconciliation in this country, we need to be honest about what happened. We need to say, so-and-so got killed by so-and-so. Um, so people begin to tell their stories. Uh, the, the, the church gathers these stories together. They come up with a final report, uh, which is really uh, an authentic truth report. Just two days after they released the report, the main architect of that report, Juan Gerardi, who was the auxiliary Catholic bishop of Guatemala City, is killed uh, in the garage of his home in Guatemala City. His head is smashed in 18 times by a cement block. Uncovering the truth has also meant uncovering clandestine graves where victims of massacres were buried. These also have been courageous acts of protest, eliciting death threats even today. These bones tell too much truth for some people. happen here. I mean, things really happen. I mean, uh, 
you can hear about something that happens like in a fiction or a movie about action and anything that can happen. But here, things really happen. What you ended up getting in 1996 was an official political end to the war, but the, the real root causes of the violence weren't addressed. The problem is that those accords have never been ratified by the Guatemalan Congress, and so they have never achieved the force of law. And so today, Guatemala continues to be submerged in violence and citizen insecurity. Las luchas de poder, la falta de credibilidad de los partidos políticos, eh, el sector poderoso económicamente que no quiere los cambios estructurales, etc., están impidiendo realmente el, el desarrollo más rápido de, de los acuerdos de paz. Un obstáculo es eh, la relación tan desequilibrada de poder económico y político en el país y que nos garantizan cerrar las puertas a las condiciones que dieron origen al enfrentamiento armado, que hoy desafortunadamente siguen presentes. Y hablo de la pobreza, hablo de la exclusión, hablo del racismo. That is another level, another layer to the culture of violence. People are hanging on by their fingernails. There is a precariousness about life itself. En el fondo me preocupa porque, repito, una sociedad que se confiesa cristiana en un 90% debería dar frutos de justicia, de solidaridad y de verdadera paz. Y eso no lo estamos viendo aquí en Guatemala. Those things are not going to happen until the indigenous population in its place within the Guatemalan society is recognized. Accepting the Maya as real citizens, not as expendable and not as museum pieces, but as a respected living force. Faith groups approach this enormous problem in radically different and often controversial ways. We are the guests of the Samaria Christian Church, a Pentecostal church on the edge of a barrio in Guatemala City. The pastor is Elias Cifuentes. The church, in his words, is in risky circumstances. It stands in support of an illegal land occupation. The technical term that they use is asentimiento, which basically means where people come and sit down. People come and put up houses any way they can in this ravine. It's an act of civil disobedience, part of a growing movement in Guatemala to confront the unequal distribution of land. The land issue itself goes way back in history, at least 500 years, when the Spanish invaded and began to take indigenous lands. In ancient times, uh, of course, uh, the plains were more available to the Mayan Indians, so that was a very important part of the economy. And the important crop was maize. As the conquest came, the Spaniards uh, began to take uh, charge. Then the cities were constructed in the plains and the, and the valleys, and the Mayas have been pushed more and more into uh, the mountains where they do produce that maize. It's been estimated that today more than 65% of the most arable land is held by only 2 or 3% of the population, much of it under the aegis of international agribusiness with vast holdings. For a lot of plantations that held land largely to control people rather than to, than to, to grow crops, if you take up all the land and these people around your plantation have no land to work on, then those people have to come and work for you. So what do you do if you don't choose to be someone else's cheap labor? You can go to the city and face a new set of problems, high rents and few jobs. Juana Portugal, her husband, and their four children have made a home in the barrio. To earn a living, they sell fruit and vegetables in a city market. 
no había luz, estaba ese, estaba ese, no estaban así, solo estaba así nada más, puro, puro el terreno, que aquí era barranco, no era, no estaba así, también lo arreglamos. Y más que todo yo vine por la pobreza, porque mi esposo tomaba mucho, tomaba bastante, no, no estábamos así como estamos ahorita. Era, no sé, nosotros suprimos la pobreza, que éramos. Y entonces por eso nosotros, yo decidí pues a buscar a Cristo para que Él amó, que se, se pueda cambiar ¿verdad? de su vida lo que era. We asked her about her hope for the future. Por el futuro de mis hijos, lo que queremos nosotros, ¿verdad? Dar historia y todo, ellos, ellos queremos que, que, no, que no van a salir igual como yo y como mi esposa, ¿verdad? Que ellos eh, salen, saben a leer, todo eso es lo que queremos, queremos con ellos, tra más que trabajamos por... He aprendido por el Antiguo Testamento, he aprendido a, a, a entender a Dios como un Dios fiestero. No es un Dios que está en cuatro paredes mirando con cara de triste o afligida a su pueblo, es un Dios que se mueve, que se encarna en su pueblo. Eighty percent of Protestants in Guatemala are Pentecostal, and among Maya congregations, it may be even higher than that. Clearly, Pentecostalism has some kind of cultural resonance. Early missionaries were building schools, and they were building hospitals, starting translation projects. They're Presbyterians with Central American Mission, the Methodist of Church of the Nazarene, and they leave a very important footprint because of that. But as in many places in Latin America, science and Western medicine and a reason-based liturgy are not enough. Hope is not nourished there. Pero la dinámica en los grupos pentecostales es yo con Dios aquí y la realidad allá. The Somaria Church challenges this perception. Precisely because of its solidarity with the neighborhood's poor. Porque no descuidamos lo que dice Santiago. No descuidamos las obras. Alabar a Dios con todas las fuerzas de nuestro corazón. Silbando, brincando, danzando, eh, usando las manos. Lo hemos hecho con toda libertad pero mucho más, tenemos una visión más amplia. El Evangelio, entonces, según nuestro criterio, no es solamente brincar, danzar y predicar y orar. El Evangelio va mucho más allá de eso. Y lo estamos haciendo. Up in the Western Highlands, in Santa Cruz del Quiche, another faith group is approaching the problem of Mayan marginalization through a particular style of education. Founded 37 years ago by the primitive Methodist denomination, the Utatlan school is headed by Juan Parr, a Cachiquel Indian, and his North American wife, Grace. This is our anniversary celebration they have uh, games between all of the classes. Life has not always been so untroubled at Utatlan. 
In the early 80s, at the same time as the Atz family was experiencing violence in Chimaltenango, the PARs were receiving threatening messages from both the army and the guerrillas. The embassy asked us all to get out, all of the primitive Methodist missionaries. I think one of our feelings during this time of, of violence that was going on wasn't so much as not expressing how we felt, you know, one side or other. It was the fact that if we did, we would probably lose the ministry that we felt was most important. Pensamos que la guerrilla iba a ser una segunda Cuba por la forma tan rápido que iban uh, conquistando ¿verdad? el territorio. We had a dorm full of kids, and some of those kids were losing their parents out in the hills. And where were they going to go if the school closed? Or we spoke out and we lost the opportunity to be with these kids. Where, where would they go? We said, we have to be uh, uh, with our kids. So that's one of the reasons we made sure that in the school no politics were talked about. We were not to express ourselves. El, el problema, creo yo, de la Iglesia Católica, uh, y tal vez creo yo personalmente que, que, que es un error que ha cometido, es que uh, se metió en política uh, uh, directamente. Y dejó por un lado el, el, su ministerio espiritual. Utatlan's declared non-political position has enabled them to survive the violence and prosper in the present. The school has 1,200 students. Some live in the dorm. Many come by bus every day from as far away as 30 miles. 75% of the students are indigenous. What's the most fun part? It looks like it's all fun. Oh, the fun part, yeah. Just to see these kids come out of the, their villages and their towns, realizing that their parents, a lot of them don't know how to read or write. And here these kids are sitting at their computers. That's the fun part, to see them go ahead, and get out into the world, and to be able to find jobs. This is my bilingual secretary. So these are 12th grade bilingual secretarial students. And um, I think, Cindy, you have some words for them, right? Um, welcome to Quiche and Utatlan School. And we hope that your stay in our country will be pleasant for you. Thank you. OK, dear Mr. Tarkington, dear Mr. Tarkington, I realize that a man in your position has many commitments. Now you're taking right now uh, between 70 and 80 words per minute. Wow. Uh -huh. But Can that's we hire the... one of them? Sure, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to go to the United States? Oh, they uh, all do. <laughs> <laughs> Getting scholarship help from people in the states, Sunday school classes, uh, organizations, uh, individuals. Yeah. I would say uh, at least more than a third of the student body of, of 1,200 have scholarship help. They still don't talk about politics at Utatlan, but what about religion? We don't teach a religion. We teach about the Lord Jesus Christ, why he came, we teach the Bible. Last year we have about 280 kids that come to Christ, to know Christ. And in our chapels, our chapels are not just all evangelistic, our chapels are talking about morals a lot. And many times the, the, the kids, they come and to see us and talk to us and they say, thank you, you know, for the opportunity you give us in the, in the school. There's been a great controversy about education. Education for what? And this is a question that a lot of the Mayan activists in the 1980s began to ask. They say, you know, it is wrong to say that indigenous identity is parallel to being ignorant and disenfranchised and poor. We need to tease out what exactly being indigenous, being Maya, really means. One of the great challenges facing 
Mayans in Guatemala is not only to effectively participate in the political debate with clearly articulated programs and goals. For example, what would be the appropriate way to design the Guatemalan state that demonstrated respect for Mayan language and culture. How does the Utatlan school stack up on this criterion? This afternoon, its young men and women are returning to their homes and villages, the wellspring of their Mayan identity. But next year, or the year after that, will they still honor their Mayan heritage or blend invisibly into the rest of society? It's a fair question for any school in Guatemala today. We are invited to attend a traditional Mayan fire ritual at Ishimche. Doña Julia, a Cachiquel priestess, is leading this ceremony with the assistance of her husband Andres and their children. She has been a Mayan spiritual guide now for five years. Vamos a empezar este este trabajo sagrado, educarnos todos. Until recently, such rituals were censured by the Catholic hierarchy and other church groups, and had to be practiced in secret. Even today, their new openness is viewed with suspicion. The ritual is being carried out to pray a blessing on the video and to intercede for peace in the world. Here beside me is Antonio Otsoy, an ordained Presbyterian minister who also celebrates his Mayan heritage, a man who lives his dual identity every day. Antonio says he thinks the division is a theoretical problem. Es un poco el, el concepto maya en este sentido, porque no se puede eh, tener eh, referencia eh, si no se tiene claridad en la referencia misma. Entonces, hacer el peregrinaje al pasado, todas aquellas palabras de sabiduría que fueron invertidas, que fueron creadas y recreadas por nuestros propios eh, abuelos, nuestros propios ancestros, Pero es precisamente eso, es decir, la, 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 las crisis, las violencias surgen en, en el momento en que se ve lo, los pensamientos, las palabras diferentes como amenaza. Que se nos plantea en todo el discurso religioso, ya sea católica, ya sea protestante, que hay un Dios que condena y automáticamente nos condena a nosotros por ser paganos. Violence, Antonio says, is generated by this distinction. Violence can cause a separation between the body and the spirit of life that is our creator. Que mi abuelo, mi abuela también era la que más hablaba de esto, ¿verdad? Este la desencarnación. In the fire ceremony, we are repeatedly asked if we want to be restored to right thought. If the answer is yes, then the spiritual guide asks the fire, have you heard the words of her brother or sister? Oh God, make yourself known to us now. Y de repente, como un cuetillo ahí en medio del fuego, ¿verdad? Ya. Ah, bueno. Entonces, sí. Sí, se ha sido escuchado. It's the next few decades in Guatemala are going to be a fascinating time of, of sorting out exactly what it is that people believe. And the church is, is really wrestling with how to deal with that. One of the things that has happened in recent years is that the historic churches have lost the ability to impose a particular belief system. And that drives um, 
a lot of the church leaders batty. If you believe what the Bible says, or at least the, the evangelical interpretation of the Bible, then you have to say, these other people are wrong uh, in, in what they believe. That doesn't mean to make them bad people, it doesn't, you know, but it means that they, they are wrong. And of course, if you believe in a heaven and a hell, those people are not going to go to heaven. We feel really sad for them because uh, we know you know, they, they go into the wrong, wrong way, you know. A veces, eh, el no darle, desde la fe cristiana, nosotros le damos el valor central a Jesucristo, el Señor, ¿no? A veces esto no es así tan evidente en la conmovisión religiosa maya, en donde más se habla de Dios como padre y como formador, pero la cristología como que no está ahí. But there's also the birth, in my view, of indigenous Christian theology. In other words, there would be a cosmovision, which is Mayan, and a Christian vision as well. Y que yo creo que, pues yo estoy segura, absolutamente segura, que Dios se revela a cada pueblo según su cultura. Que Dios no tiene límites ni pertenece a nadie, ni a ninguna religión, ni a ninguna cultura. Pero sí creemos que hay importantes cosas en que el pensamiento maya y el pensamiento cristiano pueden hacer convergencia. The most publicly expressed opposition to Mayan spirituality comes from the El Shaddai Church in an upscale neighborhood of Guatemala City. One of the messages there is that indigenous spirituality is of the devil. According to the pastor, Harold Caballeros, in his book, Victorious Warfare, the root of all the problems that plague our country coincided exactly with the pacts and covenants made between the early inhabitants of the land and the principalities they worshiped. Caballeros initiated the Jesus is Lord of Guatemala project to break these allegedly demonic covenants and bring redemption to the country. Francisco Bianchi is a member of the El Shaddai Church and the founder of a political party based on biblical morality. I asked him how he would deal with traditional Mayan religion if he were president of the country. Y si hay libertad religiosa, cada quien tiene el derecho a tener la religión que quiera y el gobierno eh, no tiene por qué meterse en esas áreas. Y Dios no nos obliga a hacer las cosas. Él simplemente nos dice, si ustedes quieren bendición, yo les dejo unas sheilas a seguir y van a tener bendición. Si no las siguen, pues van a tener maldición, pero no nos obliga a hacer las cosas. The El Shaddai Church represents what has come to be known in many parts of the world as the health and wealth movement. Health and wealth is a body of theory that really does pretty much come from the United States, and it's much more a middle, upper class phenomenon that states that you can measure God's blessing and your faithfulness by your material advancement on this earth. Yo creo que el verdadero cristianismo trae un cambio de cultura, porque trae un cambio en, en la vida. Y el verdadero cristianismo trae cambios reales en la persona, trae cambios de actitud, y eso de la actitud es muy importante. So, if you would like to move into the middle class, or you'd like to move into the upper class, health and wealth provides you not only with a, a sort of a moral paradigm that justifies what you want to do, but it also is a mechanism, and so it's very appealing to people. A very white bread kind of gospel. Yo creo que si todos nos encaminamos con una visión de nación y se hacen las cosas como Dios manda, Guatemala podría tener un despegue económico y de beneficio para todos sus habitantes tremendo. Entonces. Debemos de aprender a hacer las cosas bien, de tener palabra, de ser puntuales, de tratar de actuar con excelencia. Hay mucho que dar eh, para el turismo. Y la verdad es que yo creo que Guatemala tiene el potencial para salir adelante. Mucha gente que conoce Guatemala dice que ustedes podrían ser la Suiza de América. Y es la verdad. Entonces, eh, ahí están, pero 
Resulta que comienza entonces a ver uno que Jesús es un hombre que platica, es un hombre que ve y siente las necesidades, las viudas, los huérfanos, de los discriminados, de los desamparados, incluso las necesidades de aquellos que con prepotencia vivían en su época. Can people of different faiths cooperate in the human story to work for peace with justice? You can only pronounce the word of judgment in the world if you have first allowed that word of judgment to be pronounced in your own life. We maybe need to have our own truth commission in the United States. Aprender que en realidad hay momentos en los que no podemos absolutamente quedarnos callados. Que es necesario hacer una cultura de paz. Este en Guatemala estamos pasando por muchos problemas, pero pienso que si seguimos unidas. Eh, el cambio no se da de, del día, de la noche a la mañana. El cambio es lento, pero siempre hay esperanza. Sí. Because we bear some responsibility for what's happened there, we should care what happens there. When folks come down from the north, they come down and they want to fix things. And they want to build something, or they want to paint something, or they want to organize something. And it is very, very difficult for groups to come down and just listen and learn. The stories we've observed and taken from Guatemala will stay with us because they have informed us, but they certainly leave many questions that now demand answers. Now my boy. 
shoreline behind me now with you i will seek other seas now with you i will seek other seas